Okay, so I'm going to launch the poll. Can you see it, Rain? Yes, I can. Mm -hmm. All right. May I take it? I'm going to take it. You can take it. So do you want me to go ahead and broadcast now, or do you want to wait a few more minutes? How does one everybody quick, feel? One quick question for the beginning, Cindy. Um, do you want to be the one talking about this poll at the beginning, and then if you want to say, let's get started, that cues me in and I'll, I'll take over? Sure. Do you want me to do that? Yeah, okay. that'd be perfect. Okay, great. All right. I am going to get us started. Cindy, I submitted my poll, my questionnaire. Okay. Can you see the results on your end? I can. And now you can probably hit a share button and then all of us can see the results. But you don't have to do it now, but when you're ready to share it with the rest of the audience. And I do that when I end the poll, right? Yes. Okay. And if I need help like, with it, I'll bring you back. Looks like we have 40 participants. Maybe they're in a waiting room or? Nope, they're all on. Oh, nice. Okay, great. They're automatically muted, except for rain. So welcome, everybody, those of you who are just joining. Uh, we do have a poll up. Hopefully, you can see that. So you can take that poll while we're just waiting for more people to join on to give us a little bit more information before we get started. So for those of you who have just joined on, just wanted to let you know we have a poll up that you can take just to give us a little bit more information about who is joining us today. So while we're waiting for more people to jump on, if you would just take a minute to take that poll, we would appreciate it. And we'll get started in just a moment. If you're having any technical difficulties, you can see me talking but can't hear me, anything like that, uh, please go ahead and write that in the Q&A, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen, and we can try to help you.
Okay, so just one more time for those of you who have just joined, uh, we have a poll up just to give us a little bit more information about who is attending. So if you would just take a moment to fill that out, we would really appreciate it. And we will get started in another minute. So we'll give everybody about 30 more seconds to a minute to finish the poll and then we'll go ahead and end that and we'll get started. All right, I am going to go ahead and end the poll and then we will turn it over to Mindy. All right, Cindy, can you see my screen okay? I can, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing the results of the poll so everybody can see your screen and we'll get started. Thank you and welcome everyone to ORCA Action Month, our online uh, ORCA Action Month in, in 2020. Today's webinar will feature what we know about toxics and ORCAs and we've got a terrific panel to share some information with you. We did want to begin with a moment of silence if you would join me please. Thank you. For those of us presenting today, we are in the Salish Sea region. Not everyone on the webinar is today, but we did want to recognize that our region consists of the traditional and the present day homelands of many indigenous people and tribal nations. And we're grateful for their ancestral and current stewardship of these lands and acknowledge their place-based knowledge. Um, we also wanted to acknowledge that the what we'll be talking about today related to orcas is, is, is related to the lack of salmon, but the lack of salmon has been a problem for tribal nations for decades. And my name is Mindy Roberts. I wanted to introduce myself. I lead the Puget Sound program for Washington Environmental Council, and our mission is to protect, restore, and sustain Washington's environment for all. And our particular program focuses on policy and actions to achieve clean water and healthy habitat. And prior to joining WEC, I served as an engineer at the Department of Ecology, where I led efforts that characterized sources of toxics and other pollution into Puget Sound, and also what we need to do to clean it up. I just wanted to start with a little bit of, of um, southern resident killer whale, or you'll hear, hear me use just the simple term orcas. Um, some of you uh, are deeply steeped in, in southern resident killer whales, so please, I apologize if you prefer that terminology, but I just got used to orca task force. Um, we have quite a few experts with us today, but a little bit on their back on the background of the numbers and, and why we are here today. In 1976, after the era of orca capture ended, uh, there were very few animals and that was the first census really. And after we stopped catching orcas, so relieved of the pressure, their numbers rebounded to a maximum of 98 animals in 1995. However, since that time, their numbers have really declined over time to the point where in 2004, Washington State classified orcas as endangered. And there's also been federal action as well. In 2003, Canada uh, classified southern resident orcas as endangered, followed by the US government in 2005. And since that time, their, their numbers have, have gone up and down, but there's unfortunately been this, this drop in their numbers since about 2012 or so, um, that's been hugely problematic. And in 2017, it came to the attention of, of Governor Inslee when he saw at that point the number was 78 animals 
um, in decline. Uh, he launched the Orphan Recovery Task Force in 2018 and 2019, and I, I served on that task force. Um, after you hear from the others, I'll, I'll update you on where those task force recommendations are today. But clearly the numbers are not in a good direction and we have way more work to do to uh, respond to this, uh, this crisis. And in summary, for those of you who are newer to Southern resident uh, killer whales, they don't have enough food to eat right now. They're starving and that means their prey base is too small. And when orcas go hungry, that means the pollution that has been building up in their own tissues is released in their bodies. And it's at levels that we're worried about can cause harm to their reproductive systems, to their immune systems as well. And then finally, the Salish Sea is a pretty noisy area, it turns out. The vessel noise happens to be in the frequency of echolocation, which is what the orcas use to communicate with each other and also to find food. So the noise makes it harder for them to, to hunt. And then finally, just the mere presence of vessels, including something like a kayak, just the, the presence of vessels is enough to disturb them and limit their feeding. So all three of those threat areas need responses. Any one of these actions alone, um, we, need, we need to work on every single one of them, um, which is why the ORCA task force report focused on reducing all three of these threats. Today, we're just going to be talking about the pollution element and contaminants, but I definitely invite you to find out more about how to increase salmon numbers and how to decrease noise and disturbance. So first, a little bit of background on toxics in general, and then you'll hear from others in a little bit more detail. Um, I just wanted to talk a bit about what do we know about toxics getting into places like Puget Sound or the Salish Sea or other marine areas? Um, and the patterns are pretty similar um, across the country. It turns out that stormwater coming off of hard surfaces or roadways, that's the biggest source of toxic pollution into Puget Sound. And that's actually a pretty common pattern throughout the United States. So it isn't an industrial pollution necessarily. It's coming off of stormwater from, from developed areas that serve all of our needs. So by far, that is the largest source. In addition, we know we have toxic waste sites on uh, on the lands and in the waters as well. And toxics can be released from places like Superfund sites or in the state of Washington, we have what's called the Model Toxics Control Act, MTCA, uh, for state Superfund. And then there's other sources of toxics that work their way into marine waters coming out of the sediments or through groundwater. And then wastewater is also a source of toxics. So that includes uh, toxic chemicals that are flushed uh, through toilets, for example, that maybe have gone all the way through human bodies. In addition, there are toxics in a lot of our consumer products, including sometimes the clothing that we wear. So as those get washed, that gets into the wastewater stream. And unfortunately, too many things get dumped into the, the wastewater that shouldn't be there in the first place. So wastewater is another source of toxics. Air pollution can also be a source of toxics back into Puget Sound in the Salish Sea as well. And what goes up sometimes comes down as well. And it turns out air pollution uh, can get rain down just through the rain, but it can, it can also come through what's called uh, dry deposition as well. And then finally for, for rivers, uh, rivers and streams also carry toxics into marine waters. And that includes all of the above. So it includes uh, stormwater coming up from, from upstream areas. It includes wastewater coming from upstream toxic waste sites, and then also atmospheric deposition, bringing these chemicals back down into the watersheds that reach Puget Sound through different rivers and streams. And when I talk about toxics, there are literally thousands, tens of thousands of toxic chemicals. We really don't know a whole lot about most of them. We'll talk about a few of them today, but depending on whether we're talking about maybe PCBs or flame retardants, their relative contributions from these different sources is just a little different. And we know more about some toxic chemicals than others. Um, but the message really is that we have way more to learn about what's happening in our own backyards. So today I'll, I wanted to inter introduce to you uh, the folks you'll hear from. Uh, Teresa Lawson will be leading off. She's from NOAA Fisheries. She's going to talk to us about what we know about toxics in the whales themselves and which contaminants are of concern and why. After that, Alyssa Barton from Puget Soundkeeper Alliance will focus on that stormwater pathway I mentioned. She'll also touch on how urban sources are killing salmon in creeks in the Seattle area. Nancy Uding from Toxic Free Future will talk about a vastly different approach, which is keeping toxics out of consumer products in the first place. 
and that helps people and it helps orcas. And then to wrap up that part of it, I'll come back and talk a bit about the recommendations on the ORCA task force. And then each of us will be talking about in our own individual presentations how you can get involved personally to reduce toxics in orcas. And I'll just, I'll just cut to the chase. We need your help uh, to do this. There will be audience Q&A. So I invite you, please use the Q&A button. Um, at the bottom of the webinar, um, Cindy Hansen is going to wrap us up at the very end of the day from ORCA Network. There's some more webinars. And then between Cindy, our colleague, Green Adaman, and me, uh, we'll help manage the, the questions that you pose to us. So as the, as the speakers uh, proceed, um, please enter your questions in, uh, in the, in the um, question and answer. So with that, I am going to switch back over to Teresa's presentation. So just give me a moment here. Okay, Teresa, over to you. Thank you, Mindy. That was a, a really nice um, introduction and I appreciate you also providing a moment of silence uh, for us to recognize all the things that are going on in our world these days. Um, today, uh... So Teresa, I just realized I never gave your full introduction. How about I do that to start with? Oops, and it looks like Teresa, you might be frozen. So maybe turn your camera off for in a moment. The office. Teresa, you're, you're, um, you were frozen for a moment. So maybe turn your video camera off. And okay. I, I just realized I skipped through your whole introduction. So let me do that. Um, Teresa, uh, you might know her as Mangelo Lawson, has worked at NOAA Fisheries West Coast Region in the Protected Resources Division in Seattle for the past 10 years, implementing the SRKW recovery plan. She focuses on actions that impact prey availability and contaminant accumulation. And her research at UW before that involved estimating the accumulation of toxic chemicals in SRKWs. So now officially, Teresa, it's over to you. Thanks, Mindy. Can you hear me okay? Yes, much better. Okay, thanks. Um, and then you can go ahead and click the next slide, please. So Mindy already went through uh, the primary threats um, that the southern resident killer whales face. Um, here's a sort of snapshot of NIMS recovery plan that was finalized in 2008. And I post this uh, not because we need to, or you know, to, to let everybody know about their threats, but more to uh, keep in mind that these threats interact and they, um, you, we can't study them in silos. We need to look at each threat and address each threat, um, not just independently, but together because these threats um, have a way of interacting with one another. Next slide, please. So I've pulled just the top part of a table from the um, NIMS recovery plan um, to highlight that you know, when the plan was written, we had a list of contaminants that we thought were um, more of a threat to the killer whales at the time. And the top of the list were these per persistent organic pollutants or POPs. Um, and so most of the research since the listing of the killer whales have, have looked at the PCBs and the flame retardants, the PBDEs, um, and also the well-known DDTs. Um, and these Three in particular uh, pollutants or POPs um, are considered a high risk to the whales um, largely because they are measured in the killer whales. We've been able to measure them in the, um, in the blubber and the feces, and I'll go into that in a little bit. Um, and they bioaccumulate. Uh, um, and what that means is basically they, they resist metabolic degradation and they increase in concentration as an individual ages. Um, so they're hard to break down and, and they don't go away. Um, they're also toxic and when mixed together, they can um, have a additive or synergistic effects, so large effects um, than compared to an isolation. Um, and so the, we have other uh, contaminants that we're uh, concerned about largely because we don't really know much about them or their um, impacts. But today I'm really gonna focus on the POPs in, in the killer whales. Next slide, please. So the POPs, 
They're largely accumulated in the southern resident killer whales through the whale diet, so not through the water. So this is through ingestion of their prey and um, they like salmon and they certainly like Chinook salmon. Um, and so that majority of the And Teresa, we just lost you on your audio. If you can hear me. Um, a mother can also her, I'm sorry, what was that? We had lost you on audio for a moment, just for the past maybe 10 seconds. So the accumulation is largely from the diet and the whales consume um, salmon and largely Chinook salmon is our primary prey and that is um, the majority of the route of this accumulation for these pollutants. The other way uh, the whales accumulate uh, pops is through gestation um, and through lactation. So females are able to offload a, lar a large uh, portion of their body burden to their calves. Um, through gestation, that's approximately three to five percent of the female's body burden is offloaded to the calves. And through nursing, uh, over 70 percent of the female's body burden is offloaded uh, to their calves. So that's a large, um, a large amount. Um, and that, uh, that males, adult males, are unable to offload. So we see differences in concentration based on um, females that have calves compared to adult males. Now, why do we care? We've mentioned they're toxic, but what does that mean? Um, most of our um, studies have been on laboratory species, um, and then there's also been other studies on um, pinnipeds or seals and sea lions. Um, and, and toxicity is really dose dependent. So, um, and some of these contaminants can um, be synergistic, as I mentioned, meaning they, they can have an effect um, at lower doses than would otherwise be observed. Um, toxicity is also um, uh, And Teresa, we lost your audio one more time just for the past five seconds to the exposure of contaminants um, than uh, adult individuals. And this is also when they're receiving that large um, body burden from their mother. Um, so uh, we, we consider them at even higher risk uh, of this toxicity to these, um, these persistent pollutants. Next screen, next slide please. So back to the accumulation in the diet, as Mindy mentioned, um, these contaminants, and here is a picture of, of PCBs. Um, they're released into the environment. They go into the marine environment in particular and are taken up in the food web. Um, now, because uh, killer whales eat salmon and salmon are higher up on the food chain as well, um, we see um, biomagnification in the whales, which means really just increase in these contaminants up the food chain. Um, and the, uh, because the salmon are also eating at a higher level, we see high contaminants in Chinook salmon um, at levels that are, are thought to um, maybe impair the whale's health. Next slide, please. So Sandy O'Neill and her colleagues at WDFW have looked at um, some of these pollutants in both adult Chinook and um, juvenile Chinook. And I'm going to just show you a couple of slides of um, uh, contaminants in adult Chinook. And what they saw was they, they um, uh, collected Chinook samples from, uh, from Alaska down to Oregon. Um, and they noticed that Puget Sound Chinook in particular, had um, significantly higher PCBs than Chinook from areas in other areas off of um, the coast, um, up to three to five times more um, contamination. Can you click the next slide, please? Looking more closely at Puget Sound, what they found was that this uh, resident Chinook, or the black mouths, as they know, are they as they're called, um, have uh, significantly higher uh, 
PCBs than just Chinook that leave the system out into the coast. Um, and we know that approximately one third of the Puget Sound Chinook that um, come out of our rivers stay in the Salish Sea in the Puget Sound area. Um, whereas the rest of them head up to the coast and most of them head north. Um, but we also know that um, adults um, primarily uh, receive most of their PCBs as adults and not as uh, juveniles. They do have, um, they do uptake uh, contaminants as juveniles, but the majority of their total body burden occurs as an adult in the adult phase. And so what this is signaling to us is that, you know, we are seeing a higher contamination in the inland waters of Washington um, that is a, a concern for, for us and for the, the fish and the food web and the southern residents. Next slide, please. Uh, so Sandy O'Neill and her colleagues at WDFW also looked at, at PBDEs, the flame retardants that um, were relatively new um, and more recently banned. Um, and they looked at not just different Chinook populations across the coast, but they looked at different salmon populations. So here on the figure, we're looking at PBDEs in sort of the north central BC area, as well as further south in the Puget Sound, straight away Fuca area. And uh, they tested uh, pinks, coho, chum, so other salmon that have been in, observed in the whale's diet. amounts of this uh, contamination um, and especially the Chinook that are from Puget Sound. Next slide please. And so what does that mean for the whales? Um, so we've, uh, the greater uh, scientific community as well as uh, NOAA fisheries have been monitoring these levels in the whales. Uh, previous monitoring um, has included a blubber biopsy sampling of individuals over time. Um, and biopsy sampling is basically just taking a dart and getting about a pencil eraser size piece of the blubber to analyze for contaminants. And we take the blubber, a little piece of the blubber, um, because these contaminants, they're they're um, lipophilic or they're fat seeking. They are primarily stored or the majority of the contaminants in an individual are stored in that blubber. So that gives us a generally good idea of the body burden um, in the whales. Um, and then more recently, uh, Dr. Um, Jessica Lundin um, for her graduate work at the University of Washington was able to um, test fecal samples um, to get an idea in, of how much what their, body, what their contaminant burden was in a, in a much less invasive way. Um, and, and then more recently, um, we've been able to look at mother to offspring um, transfer dynamics. Up till now, we've had some modeling work to sort of understand um, how much the contaminants are offloaded from a female, but also which, which particular contaminants are offloaded. So we're getting a We have um, um, multiple individuals that have been tested um, or sampled multiple times and the, the goal will be to see if these contaminants in the killer whales are declining or if they're remaining the same and that helps managers understand what risks um, the whales are at. We know that they're, all, they're at a high risk but we would like to see um, similar to what we've seen in other species, such as harbor seals in the Salish Sea, have declining levels um, of pollutants. But that work won't be complete for another couple of years, I would say. But stay tuned for that. Next slide, please. So I wanted to just pause and show you some older work, um, but I think it's the best um, for our discussion today. Here is a slide that shows the monitoring levels of um, PCBs and PBDEs in 
different killer whale populations. So on the right, you're seeing a figure and the top is PCBs and the bottom is PBDEs. And the, and the graph has uh, transient killer whales or um, they're mammal eating killer whales, uh, currently known as bigs. Um, and then we see concentrations of, in southern resident killer whales and in northern resident killer whales, as well as in harbor seals. And what we've seen across the board is that you know, the transients or the bigs killer whales um, that eat in a higher trophic level have much higher PCBs than the rest of the mammal species. And that makes sense because they are, um, these contaminants, again, biomagnify up the food chain, so they increase in concentration. So we would expect to see that. We don't, we're not currently seeing it in, with PBDEs, um, but that's largely because, um, probably because it's a newer contaminant and it hasn't um, made its way into levels that we would see um, similar to PCBs, but I would imagine in like the next decade or so, we'd probably start to see those differences. But um, looking at the Southern resident killer whales, which is that, um, the second um, bar over from the left are the southern residents and comparing them to the northern residents, which is the third bar over, I don't have my cursor, but um, we see a much larger concentration of both of these pollutants, of these PCBs and PBDEs in the southern residents compared to northern residents. They both eat at the same trophic level, but they're, they're consuming their Chinook in different locations. And so that signifies that the northern residents um, are prim primarily eating so-called cleaner Chinook than, or cleaner salmon than the southern residents. What's important to note here though is that all three populations, the bigs, the southern residents, and the northern residents, they all have concentrations above the level, or con PCB concentrations above the level um, the threshold level for um, a toxic response found in harbor seals, the immunotoxicity. Um, it's important also, though, to keep in mind that, you know, the toxicity is um, species specific, but similar to uh, human health, uh, we, we have to look at surrogate species to get an idea of what the effects could be. Um, so we, we are seeing um, high levels of contaminants in the whales, which could mean multiple things, like I mentioned on the first slide, it can mean effects to their development, effects to their immune system, um, it could cause some cancer. We've seen that in um, other sea lions as well. Um, and um, it affects, um, you know, when we're thinking about what can we do, um, I'm hoping we'll have a conversation about what things, what, what are things we can do today, but it's also most important to mention, to think about, you know, the whales need to have enough prey um, so that they're not having to use their blubber storage. Um, and maybe we can have some time to discuss that as well. I think that is the last slide. Maybe there's one more slide with the pictures um, to talk about, you know, how these contaminants um, get into our local waters and what are the things that we can do to sort of reduce that or slow that contamination down. And maybe I'll just pause there. Thank Great. you. Thank you very much, Teresa. Okay, I'm stopping sharing my screen and uh, next up will be Alyssa. So you can claim control over your screen now. Um, Alyssa Barton is the policy manager at Puget Soundkeeper Alliance. And Soundkeeper is a nonprofit with a mission to protect and preserve the waters of Puget Sound. Alyssa is an attorney and she manages Soundkeeper's policy program on water, pollution, marine debris, and so much more. So uh, welcome, Alyssa. Thanks, Mindy. Um, so hey everybody, today I'm gonna to give a quick uh, stormwater one-on-one. -on -one. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the impacts of toxic chemicals on salmon as we've discussed with a closer look at coho salmon specifically. And I'm also gonna discuss one piece, just a small sliver of the current regulatory framework. Um, basically stormwater regulations through the stormwater permits in Washington state. Um, and then we'll look at some solutions to the stormwater problem. Uh, but right off the bat here, I'd like to show you why stormwater and salmon don't mix. And if I'm able, what I've got is the video, and it is of a adult male coho 
from the Duwamish River. And it's experiencing what is called urban runoff mortality syndrome that has been specifically, I'll pause. So I'll pause there. That was a, a colleague that was talking in that video. But um, we know that uh, coho specifically seem to be susceptible to this urban runoff mortality syndrome. I'm going to talk about it a little bit um, uh, further down the line. But they die within hours of exposure to stormwater due to the toxic chemicals it contains. Uh, we know that it's coming from stormwater, and we think now that the specific chemicals causing this uh, urban runoff mortality syndrome are from rubber tires and cars. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about stormwater. I like this image, which is uh, from a fellow waterkeeper across the country, because it, it shows the different pipe systems that we all have underground. And a lot of folks might already know this, but maybe you don't. Uh, we've got drinking water su uh, supply lines in blue. We've got the sanitary sewer, which carries our sewage and waste to the waste treatment plant. It's a gravitational system, goes downhill. And then we've got our storm drains. So the very basic uh, thing I find myself explaining to friends and colleagues is that storm water is quite simply uh, water that originates as precipitation, rain, snowfall. It flows over the land. It picks up whatever is on the land or our pervious surfaces, like roads, roofs, picks it up and runs off either into the storm system or directly into a local water. And the storm systems often drain right into local waters like you can see in this image. It's often not treated. Why is this a problem? It rains a whole lot in the Pacific Northwest. And as Mindy mentioned, stormwater runoff is the number one toxic threat to Puget Sound. It's estimated in uh, Seattle that every single paved acre generates a million gallons of stormwater a year. That's an awful lot of stormwater. And the Department of Ecology has estimated that each year between 14 and 94 million pounds of toxic pollution enters Puget Sound from stormwater. Of that, uh, over 90% is in the form of oil, grease, or petroleum. And one of the biggest toxic uh, chemicals in oil, coal, and gas are PAHs, or polyaromatic hydro, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAH is easy, easier to say. It's a class of persistent bioaccumulative toxic chemicals. And as Teresa just showed in her presentation, um, it, it's not as uh, nasty in terms of bioaccumulation as, as PCBs are, um, but it can be uh, as, just as, as harmful in other ways. So all of this stuff can wash on down the drain. And these are two pictures of mine, dirty pavement, oil on the roads. Cars are a huge problem in the Puget Sound region. They leak chemicals. Um, and, uh, you know, I do want to mention that it's not just cars, but there are just so many other ways that different chemicals can get into our, our stormwater. Uh, metals, nutrients, suspended solids, and fecal matter are detected in over 90% of all samples of stormwater per one, per one resource. Um, and stormwater can also transmit pesticides and fertilizers, animal waste, litter, settlement, sediment, and, and so much more, all of which cause different harms to environment, to the environment and our wildlife. Um, but for purposes of salmon and orca health, you know, we're, we're concerned about a variety of chemicals that can disrupt salmon behavior, causing sublethal impacts or have lethal, lethal impacts like these persistent uh, bioaccumulative toxics and the POPs that Teresa talked about. And I actually have the same image here that Teresa went over in terms of uh, PCBs. The same applies to, uh, well, the same flow in terms of how biomagnification happens up the food chain for PCBs applies across the board to some of these other um, PBTs, the persistent bioaccumulative toxics like um, dioxin, um, lead, mercury, and other chemicals that are regulated under the Clean Water Act. So I'd, I'd like to note that, as Mindy mentioned in her opening, we do have a lot of other streams that uh, dump toxic pollutants into Puget Sound. PCBs enter our, our waters, not just from stormwater, um, but through waste streams. P 
PCBs were banned in the 80s. Um, they're still produced inadvertently um, as a byproduct of some processes like pulp and paper production, but they were banned in products in the 80s and um, they were actually used to make plastics, I believe. Uh, but we see them in things like caulking and paint, um, still getting into stormwater from some places, including in Seattle. So what are we doing about toxic stormwater pollution? Well, Soundkeeper is doing a couple different things on the ground. Um, we're studying the problem. We're working on improving stormwater policy and regulations, and we're also litigating against polluters and fighting to protect foundational clean water laws. This slide is um, just showing that we do work on Longfellow Creek. Every year since 2015, we've gone out and done salmon uh, surveys to document ERMS, urban runoff mortality syndrome, uh, in female salmon. We're documenting pre-spawn mortality, so we're specifically looking for uh, female uh, coho. Uh, I think there's some chum in Longfellow too, but primarily coho are most susceptible to urns, it seems. So we're looking for uh, females that have died and they still contain 51% uh, or more of their eggs. So they have technically died before being able to, to spawn. Uh, we've teamed up with the uh, Center for Urban Waters at uh, UW Tacoma. Um, and um, we do these every year. We do them in the fall, I think from October to uh, December. And we know salmon numbers throughout the Pacific Northwest are at historic lows. Some populations are at 5% or less of their historic runs. And there's many contributing factors, loss of habitat being one of the biggest ones, but toxic pollution is one of the major contributing factors to their decline. Um, and so I think it's interesting and important to think about uh, the relationship between toxics and salmon and toxics and orca and how the toxic pollution issue um, impacts all levels of the food chain. So these are just our survey results. Um, the survey area is a quarter mile uh, section of Longfellow Creek, which is about a four mile long water body that uh, leads to the Duwamish River right in West Seattle. Let's see. So it's not enough to just study this problem, although that is very important. Soundkeeper um, has a multi-pronged approach. So we also work to improve stormwater policies and regulations in our region. In the US, the Clean Water Act prohibits anybody from discharging pollutants through a point source into a water of the United States unless they have a permit. Uh, the Clean Water Act permit system is called the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System or NIPDES. We like to call it the acronym. There's so many acronyms in science and policy. Um, so these NPDES or NIPDES permits contain limits on what a discharger can discharge, monitoring and reporting requirements, and other provisions to ensure that a discharge doesn't hurt water quality or people's health. And if it's uh, an in individual facility that is permitted, often they will have specific limits for individual pollutants that they are known to produce as a byproduct. Um, but if it's a general permit, that's a little bit different. In Washington, uh, the NIPDES stormwater program is a general permit program. We regulate stormwater discharges from three uh, potential sources of pollution, which are municipal separate storm sewer systems, MS4s, uh, from the image I showed you a few minutes back, um, that is those storm sewer systems. Uh, we also issue permits for construction activities. There's a construction stormwater general permit. There's a lot of sediment and turbidity and runoff that can come from construction sites. And then industrial activities, so industrial stormwater. And this permitting mechanism is really designed um, to prevent stormwater runoff from getting from from washing these toxic harmful chemicals um, and other harmful pollutants into our waters and harming uh, water wildlife and fish. So the permits are a front line for defense against toxic stormwater really um, in, in combined with water quality standards, which are incorporated into individual permits. Uh, the state water quality standards that we have um, here in the U.S. are standards that are often developed by the state. They need to be approved by the EPA, and they limit, again, the, the amount of um, each specific pollutant that can be discharged into our water. So these include those nasty toxics we've been talking about, PCBs, DDT, dioxins, PAHs, um, a lot of these um, chemicals that uh, Teresa just talked about. Um, and Soundkeeper has commented on or appealed many of the general stormwater permits um, in Washington state to make them more protective for water and salmon. 
And we've also fought and helped uh, win a battle to improve Washington's water quality standards to uh, be more protective of human health uh, when it comes to the, the specific toxics, uh, the persistent bioaccumulative toxics um, and dioxin, PCBs. And unfortunately, right now, we are reliving that battle um, because uh, right now, unfortunately, there are steps being taken to roll back those stronger standards, which is something that we're working on. And then in terms of the stormwater permits themselves, um, what I'd really like to focus on today is some solutions that have been incorporated into our general stormwater permits and some ways we know we can protect water and salmon. So there is hope. We do have solutions here. So recent research demonstrates that filtering polluted stormwater runoff through a soil column of sand, compost, and bark can reduce um, urban runoff mortality syndrome or pre-spawn mortality in coho. Um, one study by Jen McIntyre at the UW Center for Urban Waters in Tacoma um, found that filtering stormwater through this type of um, compost or soil medium resulted in 100% survival of exposed juvenile coho. It went from almost 100% die off when exposed to the stormwater to almost 100% survival just from soil filtration, which is incredible. So strategically incorporating um, certain soil mixes, native vegetation and trees into developed landscapes results in capturing and infiltrating polluted stormwater runoff that comes from rooftops, uh, that comes from driveways, other hard services, and can prevent pollution from entering surface waters, which some of you guys may already know. So this type of green infrastructure like rain gardens, filter strips, or Iberian buffers incorporates these natural solutions. It's really the way of the future when it comes to helping uh, protect against uh, toxics that are carried by stormwater pollution. Now in 2007, Puget Soundkeeper and People for Puget Sound, which is now a program of WEC, uh, Washington Environmental Council, um, we appealed the municipal stormwater permits for the Puget Sound region. And the board, the Pollution Control Hearings Board, recognized that green infrastructure is the best method of treating and slowing polluted stormwater runoff. So as a result of our legal challenge, the board required permittees throughout the Puget Sound region to adopt ordinances implementing low impact development, um, things like incorporating green infrastructure, as the preferred and commonly used approach to managing stormwater. So after this decision, Soundkeeper NWC did a little accountability piece here that's highlighted on the screen, Nature's Scorecard. Um, it's online, the website's at the bottom, naturescorecard.com. And um, basically we were just checking in to see how our municipalities doing on updating their municipal codes to require that development be done in a, in a safe way that protects water quality and salmon. Um, and, um, you know, more recently, um, the Washington Department of Ecology has reissued the municipal stormwater permits. They came out in July, 2019. They also reissued the industrial stormwater general permit last year. Um, and Soundkeeper, you know, we aren't really feeling that ecology has gone far enough to protect water quality and salmon uh, and to require some of these innovative technologies in the new permits. So we've actually appealed both permits. We are currently appealing the industrial stormwater general permit and the municipal stormwater general permit. Um, you know, we really need more green solutions, um, like green stormwater infrastructure and low impact development, um, and better mechanisms to filter and treat, and treat stormwater. Um, and we know this. So in short, you know, the Clean Water Act requires pollution controls to improve over time. The whole idea of the Clean Water Act is to get progressively better and reduce pollution so that one day, all waters throughout our region are drinkable, fishable, and swimmable. So we must change the way we develop and manage um, our land if we're gonna stop stormwater pollution. Now, this super brief interview, uh, overview I've just given, um, you know, looking at urban runoff mortality syndrome just a little bit in Coho, and then looking at stormwater permits. These are just two of many related projects and initiatives we're working on um, to help protect clean water but our, short, our time is short today, so I wanted to just close out with a couple of things you could do if you wanted to check out our website. Um, we do a lot. Uh, you can get out on a boat or a kayak patrol with us. You can pledge to reduce your use of single-use plastics, register for a cleanup or more. Um, I'm seeing the Q&A button pop up as I'm talking, 
And I hope that if I've misstated anything or if you have something to add that you do so, because I am not a complete expert. I've only been with Sanki for three years. So I am looking forward to the Q&A time to have a conversation and to see what folks have been saying. Um, and um, you got my email and my telephone right here. So thank you. Great, thank you so much, Alyssa. And you can go ahead and stop sharing your screen. Um, and when you get a breath, it looks like you've answered one question, which is how, how can somebody help uh, volunteer in Longfellow? So talk to Alyssa. Um, next, I wanted to introduce uh, Nancy Uding. Um, Nancy is a program director with Toxic Free Future, a nonprofit organization dedicated to reducing toxic chemical use in consumer products and in transforming the toxic chemical economy. And you can go ahead and start sharing your screen, Nancy, whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, Nancy's background is in environmental science and engineering, and she focuses on toxics in products and works with community-based organizations around lead exposure and healthy housing. Over to you, Nancy. Great, thank you, Mindy. Can everybody hear me? I think so. Um, yeah, so thanks for being here today, everybody. Um, we heard earlier um, how toxic chemical contaminants are one of the major threats to the Salish Seas SRKWs. And um, with the current events in mind, we can also really sort of contemplate and think about how toxic chemicals are also a threat to people and communities. Um, in this time of the novel coronavirus, experts are warning us and even reminding us that toxic chemicals are implicated in um, health effects like immune suppression and endocrine disrupting effects. And these in turn are implicated in the rising rates of chronic health conditions um, in people, and which we've been hearing can worsen the, the impacts of COVID-19. So also this, the novel coronavirus is really bringing to the forefront for us many of our society's structural inequities, including racial injustice, health and healthcare disparities, income disparities, and more. And protecting the most, we can protect the most vulnerable people from toxic chemicals and products at the same time as we're protecting um, the Salish Sea and our beloved orcas. And we can do it at the same time, and we need to do both. So thousands and thousands of pounds of toxic chemicals are still being used in millions of consumer products every year. And much of this is done without our knowledge. As you see on the screen, there's lots of different pr consumer products. We've all got this stuff in our homes and in our workplaces. Um, thinking about PFAS chemicals, um, oops, that wasn't supposed to change. Um, thinking just about PFAS chemicals, for example, these chemicals have been linked to reduced immune responses in kids. Um, and they, they're also, we know they're used in a lot of different products. Like up here, we can see um, carpeting, um, furniture, um, furniture, upholstery. Um, they're used in um, food packaging and nonstick cookware and even in some beauty products. And they're used for their water and grease resistant properties. So um, they're, they're in high use. And uh, this has resulted in almost 100% of people in the youth, US are carrying a body burden of PFAS chemicals. And that's just one example. So this is a quick summary of how chemicals and products end up exposing both people and orcas. Um, toxics in products filter out of or are released from the products during both manufacture and use. And it exposes people, the people that make and use the, pro the, um, the products, and then they move out into the environment through wastewater and air. They're in the environment that they expose fish and wildlife, and many of these chemicals are persistent and bioaccumulative, which we've already talked about before, leading to higher amounts of these chemicals in, um, you know, at the top of the food web. And that includes our salmon, it includes our orcas. So in Washington State, we now have 
the most powerful toxic chemical and products law in the US. It's called the Safer Products for Washington Act. This, uh, this law was one of the four ORCA recovery bills passed um, last year by the Washington legislature. Excuse me, 2018, that's still last year to me. And now we're in the midst of implementation of this law. So this is where um, the rubber hits the road is when we um, have the law, we gotta make sure it's implement implemented. This law gives us powerful potential for taking regulatory action on major groups of toxics in major categories of consumer products. It also directs the state to address vulnerable communities and well communities as well. So the state is mandated to use this law to protect communities that experience disparities in exposure to toxics and products. The Safer Products for Washington Act address, is addressing these five major classes of consumer uh, of toxic chemicals. Um, industrial phenolics, including both alkyl phenolophoxalates and bisphenols. Um, it's addressing PFAS chemicals, which is a class of four or 5,000 different chemicals that um, all in, you know, all under the umbrella of PFAS. It also addresses PCBs, uh, flame retardants. Now, um, we talked a little bit about PBDE flame retardants. There are a lot more of these different kinds of these chemicals, so we need to keep up our um, vigilance on flame retardants. And this law is also going to address phthalates. Um, the state is going to, uh, the state is going to decide on regulatory actions for the products and chemical categories that represent the highest use of the chemicals and the high exposure to people in the environment. But the Safer Products for Washington Act isn't going to stop here. Um, it does direct the state to identify new product chemical categories every five years. So we're going to keep going with this process. And I wanted to just um, let everyone know um, what the, the chemical product categories are that are being considered for regulatory action right now on these five chemical, um, these five major chemical classes. So as you can see, there's a lot of very major product categories in here. And again, if you think about it, I mean, one thing I do when I'm driving around the city or I see a hillside somewhere, I see, you know, you can see thousands and thousands of houses. And a lot of these chemicals are in every one of those houses. So it's, even though in your house seems kind of small when you add up to millions of people living in um, the Puget Sound region, then um, we get an idea of the magnitude of the problem. Now, um, this is a lot of text on this slide. So if you're interested and want to read more about it and learn more about these um, product categories and chemicals, please see our newest blog on our Toxic Free Future website. And, you know, this is a short presentation. Um, but I do want to, um, you know, let you know that we're working really hard on the implementation of this law. It's, um, um, we're working, you know, we're doing a lot of, of science background research. We're doing a lot of um, stakeholder work, talking to the Department of Ecology. If you would like to um, be involved in this, but not have spent a whole lot of time and energy on it, we would love to have you join us and be on our um, email action alert system because uh, citizen, you know, the citizen voice and the consumer voice is very important it, when we're going to be getting some of these laws on chemicals and products in place. So we'd like to activate our action alert system at uh, strategic points during our campaigning around these chemicals and it really um, helps us achieve a lot. So I, we would love to have you sign up and join us on our action alert system. And to do that, you can go to our website, toxicfreefuture.org. And just to end, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the work that we've been doing on PFAS chemicals and firefighting foam. And I'm, I wanna do this just because I know a lot of you are probably aware of that work that's been done in Washington. Uh, I just wanna let you know how it's going. Uh, in 2018, 
Washington passed the first bill in the US to restrict PFAS and firefighting foam. This is one of the major sources of PFAS to drinking water supplies. And it can also run directly off into streams and into Puget Sound. And PFAS chemicals are highly, highly toxic. Um, and they are used in very, very high volumes. And so, um, and they're very, very persistent. So they do not break down the environment. So a little bit, it, and it, you know, if it goes into the system, it just doesn't go away. This year, we succeeded in strengthening the bill by removing some exemptions, which is really exciting. Um, but just to give you some quick metrics, um, in a conversation I had with the Department of Ecology a little while ago, um, once the restrictions went into, first went into effect in July of 2019, um, the Department of Ecology had phone calls from 56 municipal fire departments in Washington um, to talk to them about turning over a total of 18,000 gallons of liquid, uh, the liquid version, the liquid phase of um, PFAS containing foam. So it's like the liquid that's, you know, they use blowing agents to turn it into foam. So um, 56 fire departments turn or turning over 18,000 gallons of liquid foam. So um, that can just give you an idea of the scale and the magnitude of how these state laws can have an impact on our environment. So, um, so one thing that we wanted, to, I just wanted to also talk about is we've been talking about how there are a lot of toxic chemicals out there, um, not just PCBs, not just, um, PBDEs, there's potentially thousands of chemicals that are having an impact on the salmon and orcas of Puget Sound. And so a lot of the work that we're doing is we're trying to get ahead of the curve so we don't end up with new legacy contaminants. Um, that's uh, really a big motivation for the work we're doing around PFAS in particular because it is so, it does bioaccumulate and is highly toxic and very, very persistent. And so um, we want to prevent uh, the new legacy contaminants in the Puget Sound area. So um, that's why we're doing what we do. So that's it for me. And I will take questions later. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Nancy. All right. I'm switching back over. Uh, we're getting good at the whole transfer of, of screens at this point and get this one started. Okay, and oops, not from the beginning. I don't want that. Let's just start it from here. All right, does that uh, show okay? Nancy, you're my last speaker. Does it still show in the, right, the correct view? Okay, thank you. All right, well, I wanted to, um, oops, this is still, who saw this information already? And then there were lots of other brilliant people talking. So I'm gonna start here. Um, I wanted to go back and just for the next five minutes or so, and then we'll go into a live Q&A, Feel free to answer any questions, any of our panelists in the, in the Q&A box. Um, I wanted to go back to the ORCA task force process. And overall, the task force itself included 50 different individuals representing governments at all levels, including tribal, federal, state, and local. It included elected officials, commercial and recreational fishing, boating, uh, businesses, uh, and nonprofit organizations. And all of that work, that was 50 individuals, but it very much rested on the work of three different work groups consisting of literally over 100 people, including some of the folks on this call today. Um, but it also reflects tens of thousands of public comments that were received on the 18 month process. And during the time that the ORCA task force was underway, I will say just from being inside it, there was enormous pressure to only have the task force recommend just a couple of things. Um, and the thinking was that only ask for a little bit, otherwise the orcas will get nothing. And, and I and, and a number of others pushed back hard and thought if it, it's the orca task force job to figure out, well, what is, what is it that honestly is needed by the orcas, not what's convenient for humans. However, what that means is we have a whopping 49 different recommended actions, which can be very overwhelming. But this is how we're gonna chart a course for the survival and recovery of orcas. 
So just a little bit of an overview, there's 16 recommendations related to increasing the amount of salmon available. There's 13 recommendations for decreasing noise and disturbance. There's nine recommendations for decreasing pollution. Another five for funding the work that is needed to be done, monitor our progress and adapt as we go. Five recommendations for addressing climate change because that's interwoven with ORCAs as well. And then finally, we realize that more people are going to arrive in our area in the future and we need to prepare for future growth as well. So we've got a lot of work to do, um, but how are we doing so far? And I'll just share with you my assessment of, of how these 49 um, uh, task force recommendations are, are going so far. There are six of them that I would characterize as, you know, we did pretty well. We, we mostly accomplished what we had in mind. There might be a little bit more that we need to do. There's another eight that are substantially underway. We're not done yet, but we, we made some progress and uh, we're moving in the right direction. There's another three of them that are intended to go in the right direction. We just haven't really made a whole lot of progress on that, so I wouldn't quite give them a, a gold at this point. But that means that there are 32 different actions that really haven't started yet. And we knew that this wasn't going to be accomplished in a year. We know that this is a long-term commitment, but we also need some short-term actions as well. So that's why our organizations, and not just the organizations you see on this webinar, but there are literally dozens of organizations working um, on ORCA recovery writ large, um, but we need your help to turn these recommendations into actions. So I just wanted to focus a bit more on those nine uh, recommendations related to contaminants. Um, one of them, uh, recommendation 30, is one that Nancy just talked about, which is reducing chemicals that impact ORCAs in their prey. So that's part of her, the work she was doing, keeping chemicals out of her products to start with. But the the other, another seven really haven't started substantially. Alyssa talked about number 31, which is reducing stormwater threats. And, and the coloring is not to mean that there's nothing happening. There are actions that are happening, but what we haven't done is stepped it up a notch in response to the ORCA task force recommendations or other things. So there, yes, there is some progress, but we know we need to do this faster. And then finally, number 39 is one of those that is substantially, it's underway right now, but we really haven't gotten there yet. Um, and working on um, improving our wastewater treatment plant uh, discharges going into Puget Sound is something I'm working on personally. So if you'd like to know more about that, um, please contact me. But overall, just from WEC's perspective, we, we and all of the organizations that you're hearing from and others, we need more help. We need you pulling with us on this. So I invite you to join us at wecprotects.org. We also have a public engagement campaign called We Are Puget Sound. It's a shared campaign with lots of really fantastic organizations. If you go to our website, there's a, there's a 10 part um, uh, actions that you can take, including things like voting and elections. That's really important. And then finally, just an invitation to join us on social media. Um, so lots of work uh, needs to be done. And um, with that, I'm gonna close this part of it. And what I will do is switch over to some Q&A. Um, and I think that, uh, Cindy, I'm, I'm staying, sharing my screen and, um, and just wanted to direct you to the Orca Salmon Alliance website. There are some actions related to personal behavior changes. So how do you address some of these toxics in products? So I will uh, take a pause there. And I believe, Cindy, we need to do Q&A uh, at this point. Um, so I am, I'm going to start with maybe a question for um, Teresa which is, uh, somebody asked about what are conservation canines? Teresa, can you answer that question? Yeah, sure. I, uh, I sort of, um, I had a picture of, I don't know if you can put up the picture of Tucker, I believe, um, on one of my slides, Mindy. Otherwise, um, on one of my slides, I was discussing the monitoring that has occurred um, for uh, pollutants in the killer whales. And in the past, we've done um, biopsy samples. Um, but I also mentioned that um, Dr. Lundin and Dr. Wasser um, and those at the University of Washington, um, the conservation biology um, department, they have been um, in the past um, collecting fecal samples um, to measure these same pollutants. And the way they find, the cool way they find these fecal samples, I don't know if anyone's been out on a boat, um, some of the feces 
from a, a whale uh, floats for a little bit of time while the rest sink. Um, and it's hard to um, find those with a human eye, but with a um, dog nose, you can certainly find um, those pollute or that um, whale feces much faster. And that the conservation canines, um, some of them have been trained to find whale feces um, to help the researchers track down the samples. Um, the canines also um, are trained to find other animals' um, feces as well, so they're used um, in many different projects, and I would recommend going to the University of Washington's um, Conservation Biology Department um, under Dr. Wasser uh, for more information, but it's, it's a, fun, a fun way to use some highly trained and happy dogs to help the research in, in a low invasive, non-invasive way. Um, so. Great, thank you, Teresa. Um, and Alyssa, the next question is for you, uh, I believe, which is what can we do to help minimize the amount of, it says PCPs, but I'm gonna take the liberty of saying that's PCBs. Correct me, whoever sent us that question. Um, what can be done to help minimize the amount of PCBs and other toxics running off in our stormwater? Yeah, that's a great question. So PCBs are a legacy contaminant and some organizations that we work with are trying to look at solutions, um, ways of inventorying where these products are and can we get them on a product ban list and can we get them traded out for newer products. Um, uh, but really I think the tools are going to be our water quality standards and our Clean Water Act permits because that is where the rubber really, I hate to use that saying, but it just keeps coming after rubber hits the road. <laughs> Um, when it comes to regulations because those standards are the the line in the sand where we say you can't have any more than this and then the permits are where we say all right we're gonna uh, put those limits into permits um, and then with the general stormwater permits that's um, as I talked about in my presentation sort of um, increasing um, the scope and amount of, of uh, natural solutions that are required retrofitting and low impact development that we do throughout Puget Sound. Thank you, Alyssa. And if that was meant to be personal care products, please feel free to ask another question. Um, and Nancy, I think the next one is for you. And I don't know if you, if you have the answer, but can bisphenols be safely recycled? Can they be safely recycled? Um, I that's a good question. I, um, I'm not sure if that means if they're in plastics, if the plastic can be safely recycled. Um, from our point of view, not really. And um, we're going to be doing some more work on that. We're going to be looking at some um, recycled plastics because uh, sometimes, you know, when there are chemicals in plastics, it gets recycled. And we want recycling. Um, the chemicals can get recycled and then show up in products downstream from the original um, product that has the chemicals in it. So um, that's another reason why we want to get the chemicals out of the products before they ever go in and stop that process from happening. Great. Thank and, you, Nancy. You know, it's, pretty, it's pretty major that we're getting these um, you know, the bisphenols and the safer products for Washington Act, the bisphenols in um, food can linings and in thermal receipt papers that are used, um, you know, I mean, these are major uses of, beep, of bisphenols and major sources of exposure. So we're super excited about this. Great, thank you, Nancy. Um, the next question, maybe I'll take a shot at it, but I'll invite others to join in. There's a question about how important is funding to meeting the stated goals for ORCA and ORCA recovery in this? Um, and that's a really tricky question because a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the actions that are needed are a combination of things that you and I can do personally and our consumer choices as we learn more about what's in them from people like Nancy. Um, we can start doing things. We can uh, build our own rain gardens in our yards. Alyssa talked about that as well. Um, and then finally, federal agencies are threatened with, have been threatened with gutting their, their budgets um, since 2017. So, um, so all funding is going to be important here. And then, of course, we're in an economic crisis right now. So we have a lot of decisions to make, I think, as a society on what it's going to take. I think that there's some innovative approaches out there, um, local government, state government as well. 
um, trying to figure out how do we do this even better um, over time, but there isn't, there isn't like one, one source of that. And I think the question was about corporations or wealthy individuals. Um, there are a couple of folks who are looking into how do you, how do you engage the private sector a little bit more to um, accelerate work that's needed for reducing toxic? So there's no one answer to that. There's lots of different things in motion. Yeah, go ahead, Nancy. Oops, you went on mute again. There Sorry, you. can you hear me? Yes. Um, in terms of um, engaging the retail sector and, and um, you know, products that are being sold off the shelf. We're also working on that um, with a partner, Mind the Store. So we actively um, uh, engage re major retail, we're engaging major retailers, major um, grocery store chains, and now major um, quick service restaurants in getting chemicals out of products that they're either serving or selling. And so that's a huge, huge um, piece. And one thing we do find is that it all works together though. When we, like when we pass a policy in Washington, we can leverage that policy and go to some of these retailers and fast food chains and tell them, hey, this is coming down the pike. You're not, you're gonna wanna work on this now. We could get, um, we can leverage this stuff and get more, um, more progress made all together. So it all works together. Anyone else? Okay. I feel like we've got a, a round robin question now for everybody coming from Ohio. Um, I'm listening in from Ohio, but in the last few years, I've fallen in love with the St. Lucie region and the Southern resident orcas in particular, us too. Uh, any suggestions on what someone can do to help the whales on these issues from afar? And Alyssa, I wonder if you would wanna start on that? Sure, yeah, talk to your federal, your US Congress persons, your representative, and talk about how much it matters, even though you're not over in this area. Um, you know, we need funding for Puget Sound recovery, which we get at our region and the Southern Resident Killer Whales are not just, um, you know, important for folks over here. They're worldwide, very beloved, and, and people really do care, and it's important to share that. Thank you. Teresa, any ideas um, from, the, from the federal agencies? Uh, besides um, those points, I would say there are a lot of um, uh, partners that we work with at at NOAA that rely on funding um, to provide information that is needed to know where the whales are, how they're doing, um, you know, vessel impacts, you name it. So, um, such as the Center for Whale Research, uh, where they um, get photo identification of all the whales, as maybe you are aware. Um, they're always looking for funding. It's great to donate if you can. Um, also the, you know, I can name off several, I don't want to put priority over others, but you know, like the Whale Museum, you can adopt Orca and that money goes to help um, you know, with the, with the killer whales and, um, so things like that are helpful, um, sort of, I think those so are. Know, knowing them individually. Yeah, yeah. Nancy, how about you? I'm sorry, I was distracted. What's the question? <laughs> how can someone in Ohio help the, help the Southern residents? How can you help the Southern residents, you know, while engaging in federal level policy when it comes up, which can be a little too infrequent, you know. Um, you know, also, if you want to engage in retailer campaigns, you know, this is like when we, um, when we work on getting retailers to get chemicals out of their products, we work with some of the biggies. So like Costco and um, Walmart and some of these huge retailers. So if you want to look for, um, you know, get involved in some of those campaigns, you can go look, our, look at our partner's website, Mind of the Store, and um, get involved that way. 
All right, thank you. Um, and I think I would just add in general that um, doing things like voting in Ohio is, is also incredibly important. I think looking for things like the, um, your uh, senators and your representatives, how do they feel about um, the Endangered Species Act, which is kind of the core for some of these protections or the Clean Water Act for, for toxics as well. Um, but this is, is something that everyone can get involved in one way or another. Um, and then some of the personal behavior changes. But I do think that um, as we're learning from, uh, from lots of research storytelling and just talking to people about why they're important to you is also super, um, super helpful. And telling your story on social media, through Instagram, um, sharing this and just talking to people about it. I, I know I had, um, I had a, a story related to me after um, Tahlequah. I carried her dead calf for 17 days. Um, a friend of mine, his daughter was working in Rwanda in Africa, and there were people crying for uh, Talakwa and her dead calf in Africa. And I think this is an example where orcas matter to people, they just connect, connect people. Um, and they're also an indicator that a lot of these problems that are impacting orcas, they're impacting people as well. Um, so I think uh, don't underestimate telling your own story. I think that's super. All right, Cindy, how are we doing on time? if we do one or two more questions and then we'll wrap it up. All right. Um, we have a question from uh, over the border. Um, how do Washington water quality standards compare with Canadian environmental quality guidelines and BC water quality objectives? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, at least, Alyssa, do you have any information on in water? That is a really great question and I do not know. I have not looked at uh, Canadian standards. Yeah. That's a really great one. Yeah. And Teresa, I don't know if, if you've come across that in your recovery work. Uh, no, it's not, but it is um, one of those things where it's all one water body and it's always important um, to be coordinating with our northern, uh, you know, our Canadians there. Um, so we see that in other groups. I don't know off the top of my head what the uh, guidelines or quality um, thresholds are for Canada though. Thank you. And I know that there was there was a broader discussion within the ORCA task force world about given all the work that was done on the US side of the border and the Canadians had a, a separate process on the um, Canadian side of our border. How do we meld those together and make sure that we're, we're being the most protective given as Teresa mentioned that the waters, the waters don't respect international boundaries. It turns out the salmon don't don't respect international boundaries as well. Um, so I think we've got some work to, to sync up and do some coordination across the, the border as well. All right. Um, the question may be uh, for Nancy on this one. Do you have a list of products that is sold or on the shelf that is potentially harmful to orcas? Mm, um, a lot. Um, a lot of products have chemicals in them that are contributing to toxic contamination of Puget Sound. So it's hard to come up with just a list. Um, um, if, you're, if you'd like to look into some of the companies that we've been working with that are um, committing to getting chemicals out of the products they sell, I'd like to refer you to our website and also to Mind the Store. Um, also, if you go to our website, you can just uh, slip me an email real fast. We have a summary of some of the companies that we've been working with um, that are making commitments to getting chemicals out of the products that they sell. So you can um, look into that and then, um, you know, patronize those companies. Um, also, if you have the capacity to, uh, you know, do more research on products that have less toxics in them, you know, you certainly can do that. We also have a lot of resources on our website for um, living with the use of less toxic chemicals. We have tons of tips and ideas. That's something you could do as well. And um, yeah, so there's different things you can do, uh, but that list would be a very long list if we were to compile it. Well, and I think that's a, that's a, 
wrap up, I would say for us, there is a long list of things that we know we need to work on. And you've only heard from a small subset of the organizations working on, on toxics and orcas. So whatever you can do to help out, get involved with one of our organizations or the Orca Salmon Alliance. And I'll turn it back over to Cindy. All right, thank you, Mindy. And thank you to all of our panelists uh, for being here. This was some great information. Really apologize to those of you that we did not get to your questions as we ran out of time, uh, but I encourage you to go to all of the websites from the organizations that were represented here and hopefully you can find some answers there and uh, if not, send an email and see if you can get an answer. There were some really, really good questions, so I apologize we didn't get to all of those. So again, I just want to thank everybody for being here and uh, let you know that this is part of a series. If you weren't aware of that, we are doing these webinars for Orca Month throughout June. So every Monday at four o'clock through June, we will be doing these webinars. So uh, the first one last week was called Orcas Inspire Us, and that was with Ken Balcom of the Center for Whale Research and Susan Berta and Howard Garrett from Orca Network. We do have that one recorded and it's available on the Orca Network website on the homepage, so you can watch it if you didn't get a chance to. Uh, next week, so what we're doing now is each week we are tackling a different threat to the orcas. You heard about the three main threats earlier in the webinar. Uh, so this one obviously was contaminants. Next week we will be doing one called Our Orcas Live in Noisy Waters. And that one is going to be talking about uh, noise and disturbance. And so we will be hearing from Scott Veers uh, from Orca Sound, who does those hydrophones we all love to listen to. He'll be talking about shipping traffic. And we also have representatives from Washington State Ferries who will be talking about some of the efforts that they're taking to quiet not only the ferries themselves, but just some of the construction work that they're doing at ferry terminals. And then on June 22nd, we have Our Orcas Are Hungry, and we have Dr. Deborah Giles and Monica Whelan Shields are going to be talking about the connection between southern resident orcas and salmon. And then our final webinar is June 29th. We hope you'll join us for that. That's going to be more of an informal one. It's going to be the spy hoppy hour and we're going to be getting together, showing some great videos of Southern resident orcas and just chatting, talking, telling stories and talking about why we love the orcas. So we hope you'll join us for any or all of these and you can register for these. Uh, we'll have information on our Facebook page as well as on our Orca Network website. So again, thank you all so much for joining us. And we'll see you next time. Any? Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.